I V M. Hello and welcome to the Wire Talks. I'm Siddharth Bhatia. For some time now, there has been talk among those familiar with the subject that the Indian diplomatic service is not what it used to be. By that, it is meant that diplomats are not just representing the country or the government's policies, but also actively engaged in pushing the Hindutva cause. A new research paper by an Oxford scholar, Dr. Kira Huyu, titled Saffronizing Diplomacy, the Indian Foreign Service under Hindu Nationalist Rule. I mean, the title cannot be uh, misunderstood, spells out exactly that there have been attempts by the RSS backed by the government to change the earlier secular approach of Indian diplomacy. Based on interviews with 85 diplomats, past and present, the paper says that earlier, the ethos of the service was to present India as a country that was diverse and respected that diversity. That is no longer the case. She gives several examples of how a singular, predominantly Hindu identity is being pushed. How did this happen? How did a 70-year-old tradition of this fine service, considered to be a bastion of the cosmopolitan elite, become so subservient to the needs of the new order? Our guest today is Dr. Kira Huyu who's departmental lecturer in international relations at the University of Oxford. Her research concerns cosmopolitanism, the post-Western order, international political sociology, and India in a global context. A book on the Indian Foreign Service and the nature of cosmopolitan elites will be published by Oxford University Press next year. Dr. Kira Huyu, welcome to the Wire Talk. Thank you for having me, Siddharth. Kira, if I may call you that, the Indian Foreign Service has been of special interest to you in your academic work. This is a particularly specialized area. Why did you choose this? I have been working on India in in different forms for the past decade, in fact. And the bit on the Indian Foreign Service really came in partly because I had spent quite a lot of time in India in various guises, working at the Carnegie Endowment in Delhi. I was there as a visiting fellow um, at JNU in 2019. I have a sort of nerdy academic interest in what it means to do post-Western international relations theory. Um, And all of these come together with an IR background and fascination for India in something uh, like the Indian Foreign Service. And so I the original work that I did very much traced the origins of the Indian Foreign Service all the way to the colonial period and the types of sociological and institutional legacies that emerge from that genealogy. And it then stretches now to the current moment, uh, where obviously after 2014, we see a very diff- different kind of IFS emerging. Stripped down to its essentials, the service, the IFS is Nehruvian in its vision. Rigid and flexible at the same time, and largely composed of similarly oriented, westernized cosmopolitan elites. One may even argue that most service officers come from a handful of educational institutions. But did you find that there is more to it than that? So there has always been more to the story than that. What happens with a lot of the reproduction Um, of the ISF narrative in academic work and work published outside of India is actually also a function of the micro sociology that governs the way that foreigners come to India to study India or indeed the way that IR scholars in in places like uh, uh, Delhi come to study it. So what you end up getting a lot of the time because it, it is easier to access certain kinds of diplomats, the sort of the flows of social capital in Delhi function in a way where certain diplomats are better connected to the outside world, better connected to scholars from elite academic institutions. But a very particular narrative of the IFS has always been propagated. Yes, it is um, Stefanian, it is Savarna, it is um, 
uh, of a particular class, it is of a particular political moment. That is certainly true. That does not mean that the service has only ever had that kind of sociological undercurrent. That is merely the kind of sociological setup of the people who dominate the foreign service. So, of course, you have always had, because of reservation since the 1950 Indian constitution, you have always had an, an SD contingency. You've always had an SC contingency. Obviously, with the Mandal amendments, you have had um, uh, uh, sort of reservations for OBC diplomats. Uh, you have had Muslim diplomats. All of these people have always been there. But because of the way that the sociology of sort of academic knowledge production works, those kinds of voices have not been coming through in the same way. And a lot of my work is to say, yes, these dominant voices are there and we do need to understand what kind of worldview it is that they propagate and how do they read Nehruvianism? How do they place India in the global context? All of these questions are incredibly valid. My bigger research project is also to ask what are some of the vernacular voices, some of the almost sort of subaltern diplomatic voices that have actually always been there, the kind of resentment um, towards the liberal elite that has always been there, that traditionally didn't have anything to do with the Hindutva predisposition, but rather a social resentment of the fact that one was always marginalized in the service because one's English wasn't poetic and flowery enough or because one didn't come from the pedigreed schools that one was supposed to come from. So these contestations have actually been there from the very beginnings. All understood and... Uh agreed with and of course we are not even here today just now talking about ifsb uh which is another uh, uh category altogether but on the ideological front of the Nehruvian idea to to kind of give it a label of uh, presenting india as a secular liberal diverse democracy that i think was an institutional construct wasn't it that was very much an institutional construct. And it was also the case because Nehru always considered the MEA and the IFS a bit of a pet service of his. He had a special regard for foreign affairs. Of course, the IAS mattered more domestically, but he always had a soft spot for the IFS. So he was very personally involved from the very beginnings. He would um, not only converse with joint secretaries, um, which would not be possible, I, I think, uh, in later periods, but even more junior diplomats, he would stop them in the corridors of South Block just to quiz them them on their brief and to get a sense of what was happening in the in the ministry. So he was always very personally involved, which also meant that his worldview was very much institutionally embedded. He used to be there um, in the very first years meeting uh, individual uh, new batch entrants uh, one on one. He later met them um, as, as a group. And there was a very strong sense when I spoke in interviews um, with diplomats, the oldest of, of whom joined the service in the, in the 40s, of the kind of regard that Nehru um, held his diplomats in, so to speak. But also, obviously, the, the reverse was true, that the diplomats themselves held Nehru in very high regard. So there was, this is sort of Pratap Banumetha's argument about the IFS, nothing grows under the Banya tree. Nehru was... Indian diplomacy. So that was very much institutionally intertwined, sociologically embedded, ideologically embedded. And even after he departed and governments changed, different kinds of uh, priorities came in. The language that is it was used in the service and is still used by the old hands today is, is deeply Nehruvian in nature. Did, was there resistance when you said that you were actually doing more than just talking to the usual suspects, as it were, about the usual topics. You were looking deep in the belly of the beast. Was there resistance at all? My my project was actually a lot lot simpler and 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 more straightforward from the beginning. I wanted to write uh, in the discipline of international relations a sort of sociological account of the IFS. And a lot of the questions that I came in with were actually rather rather plain uh, when I think about it in hindsight. Why did you join the Foreign Service? How has it changed over the years? How do you think about your batch mates? All of these questions. Um, how is the sociological setup? What types of other diplomats do you interact with? These are all rather straightforward questions. The complexities that came in were actually in the responses given by the diplomats. And so I was told in advance by Oxford, this is not a feasible research project. We are surprised that somebody who's worked on India for so long is so ignorant of 
the feasibility of a, of a project of this kind. And I went in and it was more surprising to me how forthcoming diplomats were. Um, these interviews were all anonymous. Um, this was important to me for two reasons, partly because it is important to me for research integrity purposes to protect anyone from any repercussions that might uh, ensue, but partly also for a democratizing function. The people who are usually very comfortable attaching their name to quotes for researchers are former foreign secretaries, are sort of Stefanian uh, affiliated, uh, whereas the more critical or vernacular voices are the ones who are not comfortable putting their putting their name to quotes. And so I decided also as a question of research ethics um, to anonymize everyone. And that obviously broadens the Overton window of what can be discussed. But I think the crucial point for me to s- sort of point out here is that it was never it was never me pushing those conversations. It was that I was incredibly surprised to find that, although it's not there in the academic record, it's not there in the public conversation, diplomats wanted to talk about caste in the foreign service. They had varied views on, on reservations. They had very particular sense of the dichotomy between general category candidates and what they patronizingly called uh, reserved types. And so all of that was presented to me. I I took it in, I, I redirected a lot of the project, but it was, it was rather that there seemed to be sort of pent up interest on the side of diplomats as well to, to get this out there into the world. When did you start uh, realizing that the saffronization, as you call it, was becoming an issue for a lot of diplomats? Because obviously they spoke about it. When did you start realizing it? And when did you start? start then working on that aspect i think the i think hindutva sat in the background as a sort of third uh, third member of the audience as a bystander in every interview from the very beginning um i made a very conscious decision in most interviews not to raise it and then it was brought up again by the diplomats themselves not necessarily in in those terms not using the correct vocabulary, not naming names, but a sort of um, the intellectual historian Quentin Skinner has this saying about how individuals are never, when they're saying something, they're also doing something. And so what are diplomats doing when they go on and on, for example, about the sacrosanctity of Indian diversity, when it's not something I had asked about, or the importance of distinguishing between an enlightened patriotism and a narrower sense of nationalism. Why are these topics coming out and why are they being discussed when we talk about the future of um, of Indian diplomacy, for example? And so I would say that the Hindutva was always there as a shadow, as a context, as a contrast to the kind of India that a lot of these diplomats had been um, originally uh, brought up in. And so, of course, retired officers, especially if they were of a Nehruvian dispensation, a lot of them, of course, later Congress affiliated, so coming very much with their own own political preconceptions, would bring it up of their own accord. What happened more with serving officers were, again, especially because they were serving, I did not query them on these questions. They would use these kinds of euphemisms. And the article that we are sort of talking about actually emerged from snippets. It wasn't meant to be an individual research project. It is sort of, it is there in the, in the larger research project. And I started realizing that actually quite surprisingly to me, there is enough material here for a separate article. And it seemed to me important to raise that because these small gestures of recognition, such as talking to a millennial, um, millennial officer sitting in South Block who had asked me into his office. We had agreed that um, I usually recorded all these interviews, but we had agreed I wouldn't record him because it made him more comfortable. We were then sat at his office desk and it had nothing on it but our cups of chai and an issue of the caravan. And it seemed to me that the caravan was not placed there haphazardly. It doesn't seem like the kind of reading that you would do as a, as a, as a serving diplomat uh, just so. Um, while in while sitting at your office, and it seemed like something was being signaled, uh, so I I skirted around the issue. I wouldn't address it. It did not seem to me an appropriate thing to do, but it seemed to me that it was the diplomats trying to signal something. And so you have to be incredibly careful as an academic, I think, from an ethical perspective, to balance the importance of objectivity and the importance of being able to speak truth to power or hold on to academic integrity and not revert to niceties and euphemisms. And at the same time, be incredibly careful knowing that you are an outsider coming into a space 
it is not your own space. And it is a leap of faith on the behalf of, of many diplomats to talk to you to begin with. So how do you balance those as a, as a researcher in a moral framework? When you think about it, what is happening is you could argue that the service is representing government policy. Uh, in your words, uh, you've said it at one place, the traditional, I quote, the traditionally amorphous meaning of Indianness, purposefully broad in its definition, is giving way to a narrower assertiveness which sees Indian diplomats representing not a post-colonial coalition or a secular state, but a Hindu Rashtra. And the diplomats are being told to push it. I mean, unquoted Rashtra, and the diplomats are being told to push it. Is that what it is? And is this not in keeping with the policy of the new government? This is uh, certainly in keeping with the policy of the new government. This is precisely what one would expect with a radical ideological uh, break in the kinds of governments that one sees. I imagine that what is at play is simply that the foreign service itself cannot be changed overnight. And so what you have in a lot of foreign services, including the United States, is that most of the senior positions are in fact politically appointed, certainly so with senior ambassadors. That is not the practice in the IFS. There are individual cases, mostly in the past, but there is no tradition of lateral hiring. There is no tradition of political hiring. And so what you have is institutional memory, a particular sociological makeup of a service that has a very clear character. It might be internally contested, but to the outside world, it is really quite straightforwardly Nehruvian internationalist, third worldist, what I call a sort of permanent protester in the halls of, of power in international institutions. And so the shock is not so much, there is nothing surprising to me in the fact that a service would be asked to represent the government line. I, I think um, that is, is very much to be expected. What makes the situation so fraught is that there is a strong uh, institutional culture that clashes with what is coming in and that it exposes fault lines that have been there from the beginnings. It rips them open and it forces into light resentment, resentments and contestations that have been there all along but have never bubbled to the surface. So your uh, narrowing down your uh, observation or conclusion is therefore that the, there is institutional resistance to this idea and why it is, etc. Because the earlier was a Nehruvian vision and that will take time to change because that's so entrenched. But the Nehruvian vision was also in the sense of presenting India in the most benign terms as an secular, diverse state, which is how Nehru saw it. And uh, it's not a question merely of institutional change or resistance, but it is also could be a question about, shall we say, not moving away from that reality to push an agenda, which is trying to break up that reality. You see what I'm trying to say, that India continues to be a diverse state, but secularism is the problem. So let's stop both. That's what they are being told, and that's not going to happen. No, it's not a question of uh, it's not a question of these obdurate traditionalists sticking on because they all went to Stevens. But it's also a question of what they see has value. I I believe that they are following what uh, is is commonly referred to as the idea of India, right? And it is a very particular reading of the country. There is no. As an academic, I'm always quite allergic to any assertion about what real India is, what is true India. It was very much part of the long conversations that I had with Indian diplomats, that there were all these truth claims about what is the true reality of underlying India. There was the view that India is more backwards than we are claiming to represent it. There was the view that India is more diverse than how we're representing it. There were all these competing, clashing uh, sort of ontological claims about what it is that India is. To me, what's quite interesting is the battle of narratives. And there is the idea of India as inclusive, as diverse, that reflects the ground reality demographically, that India is uh, a remarkable democratic project that has not been undertaken in this fashion in any other country. This is what frustrates me quite a bit when I talk to 
counterparts in Europe or try and talk to Finnish media about the complexities. Uh, we come in with these binaries about India. We come in with an incredibly exoticized understanding of what it is. And I try to say to them that in order to understand what is happening now, you also need to understand that India has been on the path of doing one of the most radical projects in demographic, demographic imagining in the history of humankind. You're trying to keep together not a country, but a civilization. You are trying to keep together a country of different religions, different castes, different l languages, different uh, regional variations. And this is not a, an obvious project in preserving unity. It's a, it's a backbreaking project of trying to envision and imagine a kind of India that can sustain its own diversity in a political fashion. And I suppose what is happening now since 2014 is simply a different reading of how to manage that diversity, which is in essence to suppress it, find a new language of unity, find a different internal other, find a different way of constructing the polity. We'll be right back after this short break. What is the workplace and how does your gender and body affect your right at work? Hey, I'm Priya Mirza and on the Longest Constitution podcast, we critically examine the vision of the Indian constitution and laws. In season one, we looked at sex, gender, sexuality in India and the landmark judgments which transformed our rights as citizens in this country. In season two, we discussed the laws which shape the workplace and examine how ability, competence and merit impact us and much more. Join me, Priya Mirza, every Wednesday only on the IVM podcast app, website and all the major podcast streaming platforms. Welcome back to the Wire Talks. If I uh, didn't know any better from what you've said a little earlier about being a, a little wary of any kind of imposed binaries, I would say you just spelt out the Nehruvian vision just now uh, of <laughs> the diversity and multitude of languages, etc. But I, th I think th the idea is not to get into a polemical argument or an academic argument, though I must confess up front that Nehruvian or not, the notion that diversity is what we have and what we must acknowledge and what we must respect is something that I would agree in. But then maybe, by the way, I went to some Bombay college, but I concur with this notion that it is a, it is a idea worth preserving. But we need to move on because I think what I also saw in your paper, which I read in, uh, with great interest, is that that bit about RSS people or local Hindutva representative from the, among the Indian diaspora, that part I found very disturbing that they are coming in as outsiders and pushing their agenda. Is this widespread uh, and is it only in countries where there are, there's a sizable Hindutva presence like the US, Britain, Canada, Australia? Um, I'd be very wary of making strong empirical claims on this. The bit uh, in that paper is actually a direct quote from Ashish Ray uh, for, for BBC World Service. And I don't know what his sources are. What I have are individual observations by individual um, officers who say that, in fact, um, there have always been individual officers in the history of the service who have striven to bring a more religiously tinted way of representing India abroad. They have brought RSS figures, for example, uh, into Republic Day celebrations on the 26th of January or Independence Day celebrations, so forth and so, so on. What used to happen, of course, is that they got a scolding and they were told not to do it again. And that is what seems to be changing, is that the yes, there is a backlash. Um, from secular-minded Hindus and non-Hindu officers when these things happen. But because it is now go government uh, sort of sanctioned in many ways, there is less space to negotiate the types of organizations that one interacts with um, on missions abroad. Um, I would not be able to speak to what countries this happens in. I would not be comfortable speculating on empirics that I can't actually uh, personally verify. But it seems to me that what has shifted is not only the number of times that these collaborations with Hindu organizations happen abroad, but that when they used to happen in the past, uh, there was a very strong institutional reaction against them. And what now obviously happens is that uh, 
this is either government mandated or tolerated? It's more or less government uh, directed that uh, this should be done. I know of a case in England, certainly also in Canada, where uh, uh, influential figures have come in and insisted. In one case, there was resistance. Uh, in the other, there was uh, a very welcoming reception. As you said, even in the past, there were, but that went against the grain of what the service wanted to do. By and large, did you find uh, diplomats resisting or uh, giving in or considering their career options or what? I think unless one is a personally committed believer in the government's agenda, one is, especially when, if one is still serving, left with quite a few contradictory impulses. First, of course, is the importance of um, being able to continue in one's role in a meaningful fashion. You cannot, I, I think, sort of heroic acts of resistance, especially from service officers, we would be somewhat romantic in expecting them. Um, there are ways of navigating those contradictions, ways of finding maybe ways of pushing the envelope or bringing in the language of of diversity into communiques or, or speeches. And so finding ways of negotiating how that uh, Hindutva agenda is, is communicated to the outside world. Of course, it is also uh, much as it is, in fact, was advantageous for officers under Congress to align themselves a little more enthusiastically. This is not, politicization of the IFS is not although this is something that, that the old guard would dispute, is not, in fact, a new phenomenon. It is, the, the service has always, in some ways, been politicized. It just used to be that the politics were very different. And so, of course, there are career incentives in aligning yourself with a, an agenda that you might not personally or ideologically align yourself with, but that you know is now the only game in town. And if you want to stay um, in government, this is, of course, how you would need to do it. I would, I would very much be intrigued to see similar papers on you know, the diplomatic service under Trump in the States or the diplomatic service, which obviously was quite um, pro-European um, in the wake of Brexit in the United Kingdom and so on and so forth. And so I imagine that what is happening is not, uh, we were talking earlier about the difficulty of first saying, oh, it can't be a simple binary. And then for purposes of clarity, we always end up using binaries ourselves. But I imagine that a lot of people are left with contradicting impulses and they're trying to make a sense of of how to move forward. What was interesting to me when The Wire published um, an article based on the journal article that I had um, written was that uh, there were responses from, from uh, senior IFS officers to the piece itself. And some of them said, in fact, the situation has gotten uh, much more rigid. Or, in fact, um, Kira's paper downplays the, the um, amount of resistance. And, of course, I, as an outside scholar who had access, but had access on very particular terms, can't know if there was always more resistance. And it was not articulated to me or I didn't catch it um, analytically. Or whether, because these interviews happened in, in 2019, the resistance has, in fact, grown. That there is a sense, I was there in Delhi when the government was re-elected. That there is a sense that now with a with a second Modi government, there was a change in tone on Kashmir, a change in tone on a number of issues with the citizenship amendment, so on and so forth, that there is now a greater incentive to, to speak out. There, um, uh, the reactions that were given to the wire off the record or off the article's publication is more or less concurs with a couple of friends of mine whom I have spoken to, uh, retired, I must say, who have said that uh, this is uh, really towards the last two or three years of our life, we saw what was happening. One particular person who I know was very capable officer, very, very skilled, very capable, did some good stints, retired, he's gone and become a kind of translator or something, things that he wanted to do. And he speaks to me quite regularly on various subjects. And he said, thank God I can breathe again. So you can well imagine what uh, the others must be feeling. Yes, there were Nehruvians in the truest sense of the term. 
but uh, they were not careerists they were not congressmen for certain because i have heard them criticize the congress left right and center the beauty of the congress was that you could criticize the congress and probably do better than <laughs> you would otherwise in some cases but uh, it was not a perfect situation but certainly i have seen great discomfort with what's happening now and i think i may just add here without taking away too much time is that uh, the discomfort was not merely personal it was also about how to represent the country how do you represent kashmir after uh, the abrogation you just cannot speak in that language anymore or ca or whatever so i think that was also a major discomfort of being in a dilemma did you find that that also came about I I think uh recognizing that people have uh political views in, in no way certainly and I would concur with you it takes away from the very sincerely held broader values that have to do with the way that you imagine yourself representing India or what you in fact believe India to be I had instances I had a a a um retired recently retired Sikh officer who was talking to me about the kind of India that he had sought to represent we had had in fact a brief conversation about what happened in the 80s with Sikhs in the service um and how alienated they felt and how they were seen uh with suspicion but how quickly the secular ethos absorbed them into the service because there was such a strong belief in a diverse india there was str- such a strong belief that what really underlay the project was strong enough to overcome political moments in time that seemed to stray those um, sort of communal relations and this officer then when he was describing the service as he sees it now broke out down in tears he started crying in front of me and i do believe that the sincerity of the views that came through the great emotion and and conviction with which they were shared is is precisely what has uh, has sort of engendered the the types of resistance we also see now that there is a sense in which of course it is always difficult to represent a country because no country uh, is exactly the way you would want it to be the entire point of being a diplomat is is finding some some way of transcending your personal views and representing the country i spoke to dalit diplomats who said oh it was very uncomfortable for me you know 20 years ago to represent india at the un and say there is no caste discrimination because i as a dalit officer know that there is caste discrimination so those compromises have always occurred but certainly the the anguish that was very apparent in the interviews not only uh, with the foreign service elites but young officers coming in millennial officers who've only been there for a, for a few years and so don't have that kind of legacy uh, hanging above their heads was was very palpable so a new class will come which will probably start with this uh, this idea uh, but you've got somebody i think it is a it's a it's a, a person outside the service but supportive of the government i try to find out is it a hindutva votary of some sort who says to you that it will take a decade and a half before the ship totally corrects its course but uh, personally uh, the way you uh, describe it and anecdotally what i'm hearing it may happen much before that isn't it because it's a question of career of security new officers and the government aggressively pushing its cause so it may well happen uh, sooner than later yes this was a quote from a bjp affiliated contract worker um at the mea and um in fact one of the the points that i have heard most um after the um after the article came out uh, unless they were sort of political points was that people were had a very different sense of the timeline than what i estimated in the article about the generational churn and the sort of change in institutional culture that it is precisely and and it was never that they thought it would take longer or that there would be uh internal resistance at greater level it was always that um that the institutional change would happen a lot more swiftly than i i had estimated and i i suppose I would certainly if I were to write the paper now and certainly if I had done the interviews later and not in 2019 I would probably have written it differently I probably would have said it it will um take less I would um I would agree with you there said I the problem of course is that um although it was a painstaking endeavor often to get um 
Indian diplomats to to sit down and you know conduct these 85 interviews they were possible and people were candid to a point that I was <laughs> uncomfortable with sometimes that is no longer possible there is now um, an official rule in the MEA against speaking to academics and so I suppose officially we won't be able to tell because these kinds of interviews won't be possible anymore. Any personal feedback you've had from diplomat friends in, uh, say, London? I don't have diplomat friends. I try to <laughs> maintain some academic contact. Contact. <laughs> I do know. I do know that people with better political access in in Delhi, who are themselves academics, have heard varying uh, responses to this article. Either recognizing themselves in it, presumably a lot of them thinking that that quote might have been from them personally, or that they they uh, see themselves in the article in some ways. But then from what I hear also, quite a lot of pushback, especially in, uh, in the ministry currently, about the fact that this was not a piece uh, done by an Indian. It was not a piece done by uh, some kind of insider, but it was in fact done by a young female um, white scholar um, from the West. And that is also something that is being used against the article. Who am I to to come in and uh, make these observations? Who am I to come in and conduct an academic inquiry into a space that is not mine? And frankly, I think uh, that some of it is um, is valid. The, the book that's coming out has pages and pages on critical reflection on what it means for somebody like me to come in. What does it mean for my access that um, I could come in with Oxford credentials and say, well, I am coming here from Balliol College. Could I have an interview? And uh, the types of social capital that allowed me to accrue. Or the very fact that a lot of times when people saw me, this is a young blonde woman from elsewhere. Um, there was assumption of naivety or political innocence on my part. Oh, she must not really understand the context um, she won't understand the coded words we use around terms like merit when it comes to conversations around caste. And so there was also a sort of candid nature that the conversations that frankly came from the fact that people um, underestimated my ability to read the conversation we were having. And so those conversations about who the academic is who comes into those space, I wouldn't necessarily have it on the terms that are potentially being had in Delhi in certain quarters, but I do think it matters. And I think we as academics need to be quite critical about what our own habitus means about the types of people who will talk to us and about the types of answers that we end up getting. And I think those are all, those are difficult, but they're very legitimate questions. Um, personally, I think um, academics, especially nowadays, are given to too much self-reflection. And uh, <laughs> perhaps to uh, put a spin on it, woke guilt. But uh, I think the paper is uh, strong. And uh, whether you are young, blonde, white from um, Oxford uh, gets you access, sure. But after that, you are on your own. The questions you ask, the responses you get, if somebody breaks down or pushes the caravan in towards your direction or uh, is more uh, voluble than uh, he would be or she would be to others, it's a uh, neither here nor there, because I think the end result matters and the kind of responses you get matter. And I think uh, this is a landmark paper in the sense that an Indian scholar would have been a little more wary of doing it, or maybe they'd be close to the picture, to be fair. Uh, but um, it's, it's something that is needed in terms of maybe raising a debate at the very least. So, um, I I don't I think that 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 is a point to be considered. But if it's used to rubbish the whole enterprise, then it becomes completely invalid. I, in conclusion, I'd just like to say, and I welcome if you also want to respond to this, is that uh, there is a there is a major uh, course uh, old course which is being changed. I won't say corrected, but it's being shifted, and. Uh, it is being shifted like much other, many other things like history books, education in general, Indian cinema, which has also presented a certain point of view, culture. These are things that uh, matter, institutions. Along with that comes the capture of independent institutions. So there is a shift that's happening. 
and uh, it's no it won't be surprising if a bastion of uh, the old guard like the foreign service also gets affected so personally i think that between the decade and a half and much quicker i would go for the middle because i personally think resistance you've said resistance comes in many ways so that resistance will continue there'll be small acts of guerrilla sabotage but uh, it will continue do you broadly have anything to say or you agree or don't uh, i would very briefly actually just i suppose note that i find it interesting that you brought up the word woke in her um how academics try and situate themselves in this space. I think the navel-gazing argument is certainly there. Of course, the importance of talking about who you are when you come into a space is actually something that sociologists have been doing from the 50s and 60s. And so it is uh, is a sort of methodological question more than anything else. But interestingly, while this piece has been read by those who want to read it um, as such, as as politically motivated, it has been read as um, from a very particular perspective, what is interesting to me is when when i was writing this paper um and it was out in review for review reviewer two told me in fact this uh this article does not have enough positive interview quotes about modi and if i am to accept this for publication uh, this is blind peer review, so I don't know who, what, who, which academic is writing this. Then I will need to see more pro Modi quotes. And so what we're seeing is not only that the phenomena we are studying are becoming increasingly politicized, is that the academic word work that gets produced and the process of academic publishing itself, not only in India, but in in Oxford, in London, is about becoming politicized. So an academic that presumably works in the same space as me, Indian IR, under the guise of um, academic anonymity, tells me that I need to write an article that is more favorable to the government. I am sitting here trying to hold to levels of academic integrity, present um, as broad a picture as possible, and it is the reviewer saying, this needs to be in Bromodi. And I wrote back in response saying, well, in fact, I have included every single positive response that I got. Um, I, I noted in the wire piece that um, that uh, Mr. Rahman was saying that it seemed like maybe I was going too far in the direction of being objective and trying too hard to understand the BJP line. So I've gotten I've gotten attacks from from both sides. But I suppose it's not an attack, by the way. That's not an attack. No, no not, in, not in his case. Um, in in fact, I. I I think that that he might be a person that I have read and quoted in the in the, in the book itself. It's rather that the difficulty of uh, you will know this much better than I do working in journalism in this country. The difficulty of trying to get to some sort of truth of the essence is is has always been muddied, but it is becoming muddier and muddier. Research access and research impact are often misaligned. So if you can write on a topic that garners a lot of interest, it probably does mean uh, that you have shut yourself off from certain people who no longer want to speak to you. And these are all important um, compromises for, for people to decide for themselves. And I, I, I wish I had some grand conclusion um, for the podcast, but for me, it is this constant back and forth and trying to think about how to engage with the changing India. As you said, we don't even know at which pace it is changing, what direction precisely it might be going in, and what the sort of limits and boundary conditions of those moves are. And so, how do you how do you make sense of it in a way that still allows you to be, um, yeah, academically rigorous, um, ethically upright, uh, and yet not compromise on what you do believe needs to be said because it is simply uh, what you are observing. Yeah, yeah, it's a very difficult process. It's a work in progress, and many of us are equally uh, trying to come to grips with it. But uh, sometimes uh, certain things become too obvious, and they are in your face, and that you can understand the and the broad, broad contours are pretty well known. Thank you, Kira, for that assessment of how the Indian diplomatic service is changing or being perhaps forced to change. That was Dr. Kira Huyu, who's a lecturer in international relations at the University of Oxford, discussing her latest paper on the saffronization of Indian diplomacy. The old order, which has held for 70 years, advanced the idea of India as a liberal, secular democracy, which respects diversity, is now trying to resist this imposition of a more narrow view 
based on Hindutva and Indian nationalism. Dr. Huyu provided us with the framework of this shift and the granular details of how this shift is being resisted, not only at the individual level, but also institutional. We'll be back again next week with another guest. Till then, from me, Siddharth Bhatia, and the rest of the Wire Talks team, goodbye. You can check out this podcast and other interesting ones on the Wire website, the IVM podcast website, app or wherever else that you get your podcasts. Goodbye from me, Siddharth Bhatia and the Wire Talks podcast team. Hello, hello, hello. It's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On Cock and Bull, Cyrus Nivedita Kajol and Shreyas talk about who, that's the World Health Organization, declaring monkeypox a global emergency. On a sip of finance, Priyanka explains the three simple concepts of life insurance, revival, surrender, and survival benefit. On Ikaduka Economy, Abhinav and Ashok talk about the changing dynamics of the Indian job market post-COVID. On Simplified, the hosts talk about the evolution of branding and whether brand building is worth it. And on All Things Policy, the Takshishila folks talk about the effects of the Omicron variant on children. Once again, everybody, remember we have amazing merchandise available. You can go to ibmpodcast.com slash store or go to our website and you'll be able to see the link. Do check this out. Do buy some stuff. It really does help us out. Do remember, follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Also, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Remember, if you do tell a friend about a show and they listen to the show, you'll have somebody to talk to the show about. We'd really appreciate it. Also, if you could give us a rating on whatever platform you're listening to us on. And finally, do remember, we're also available on YouTube. A number of our shows are available as full video shows, but every show is available on YouTube. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, both Lifestyle, Small Case, Cap Gemini, and Intel V Pro. Thank you so much for making this possible.